the mission of Dieter is to open up theology to the arts and the arts to theology. That's the sound of home, the music of America. That was Gerard Gilbert's fanfare for the common man, written in 1942, when you can get away with titles like that. A response to the entry of the United States into the Second World War. And ever since, it's been a kind of hymn for America. You'll hear it in Saving Private Ryan, accompanied the final flight to the space shuttle in Denver. The dedication of the Mandela Museum in Manhattan, the Obama inaugural, Pope Francis' visit to the Lincoln Memorial, even the Chicago Black Hawks have found it irresistible as an anthem of solidity and safety, a kind of epic anthem of homeland security. <laughs> and that's not surprising, really. Its pulse is very steady. It uses a whole realm of a range of fourths and fifths. That kind of sound. These are open intervals because America has all the space in the world. 
you're American, after all. Most of its melodies rise confidently with rich accompanying chords. It lives inside the home of B flat major. And there it stays. And even when it does go somewhere else at the end, up here, that's even better than B flat major. <laughs> after all, who wants to go anywhere else but America? Things can only get better. It's basic to being human that we need a sense of home, of belonging. Many of the Psalms of the Old Testament celebrate the sense of unshakable security that comes from being solidly rooted at home. Psalm 125, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which can never be shaken, never be moved. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people now and forever. And yet, and yet, you may well be shifting a little uneasily by now. Not just because someone with an English accent is telling you about America, <laughs> but because we all know these psalms, these very psalms, also ache with the sense that God's people are often far from home, that the future home they long for has not yet. Reading them will remind us today that millions all over the world are not at home and have little sense of belonging. Or the better tomorrow, even in this country. As I speak, many are being forced out of whatever home they have because of language, skin colour, mental ability, not to mention catastrophic flooding. In a hundred ways, we're haunted by homelessness. In Gillian Welch's words, we're orphans on God's highway. And musicians feel a little uneasy if they're asked to play music that stays home all the time. For them it feels a little unreal, because most of the music we hear doesn't stay at home. It goes places. Most of it starts at a home, goes away, and returns. Hear that in this Slavonic dance by Vozha, the Czech composer. We start at home in a bustling harbour, but before long we're a ship on very stormy seas, feeling decidedly seasick as the boat lurches from side to side.
is built into 90% of the music you'll hear in this culture, from Tartini to Taylor Swift. <laughs> Virtually every song on your playlist is built, has that built into it. Indeed, every song or hymn you've ever sung in the church will have that pattern built into it. Sometimes, though, it takes a long time to come home, as the great Leonard Cohen knows. <laughs> away home, but now we're really going to go away. Now, of course, the theological bells, I hope, are ringing merrily by now, bringing to mind the haunting parable of a son who left home and journeyed into a far country and returns to be swept off his feet. The story of Israel from home, exile in Babylon, how long, O Lord, and then a return. And Jesus himself, what Karl Barth called journey, or as he put it, Karl Barth putting it, the journey of the Son of God into the far country to win us back from our self-made exile, to recompose our broken hallelujahs. This is the rhythm at the heart of the Christian faith, and music gives you a sort of concentrated experience of it, of what it feels like to make a journey from home away and back home again, the journey Christ has already made on our behalf. Through music, we can re-enter and re-hear that story, perhaps rediscover it as if we've never heard it before. For the rest of this evening, well, I want to, hear, want, uh, to present to you four musical expressions of what it means to journey away from home whether literally or metaphorically. And we'll do this to open up the Psalms in particular, so many of which deal with just this experience. And in the second half, don't worry, we come back home again. First of all then, there's the music of yearning, yearning for the home we've left behind. No one does this quite like the Russians, and perhaps no one quite as well as Rachmaninoff, who actually looks remarkably like Leonard Cohen. <laughs> I don't know if that has any theological significance at all, but you can work on it, all right? So back to Rachmaninoff. In 1917, the Leninist regime seized his home and he fled his beloved Russia with his family, quite literally on a sledge in the snow, never to return. He reached the United States, he settled in New York, and he was comfortable there, but he never ceased to yearn for home. Virtually all his music is shadowed by a sense of losing a home, losing a place of belonging. And in this he joins all who yearn for the rootedness they once knew, the derelict on the street corner who aches for the blissful childhood 
he once enjoyed. All who say to themselves, if only it could be like it was. But you know it can't be. The psalmist, in exile perhaps, who pines for the Jerusalem temple, my soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home there and a swallow a nest for herself. Psalm 77, I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. Or even more extreme, Psalm 137, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Now, Rachmaninoff's most famous piece, used in a hundred movies, was written actually before he fled to the strange land of the USA. But it's saturated in a style he drew on for the rest of his life. And that's his second piano concerto, which I'm sure you'll recognize. Its main theme in the second movement centers around this note, E. But he always wants to go somewhere else. It's not really a home that he enjoys. I'd rather be there. But I'm pulled back. Could I just be there? No. Right, let's make a big effort. How about this way? No. Surely. No. How about this way? you get the idea. He always wants to be somewhere else. And that's what makes his music so extraordinarily pointed. There is an elsewhere, distantly recalled, but unachievable and lost. You never get there. It is actually an extraordinarily sophisticated piece of music. He doesn't, please note, give you the past. It's not simple nostalgia. He makes you ache for a past you know is irrecoverable. Makes you aware of loss, which is bound to make us ask at the deepest level if loss is the last word of the human story.
I wish we could play all of that, be like there we go. Second, a second musical take on not being at home, the music of estrangement. And for this we turn to another Russian, and another second piano concerto, written 50 years after the one we've just heard, by Dmitry Shostakovich. Shostakovich never left his home country, apart from a few short trips. He spent his entire life in the Soviet Union. And yet he was never at home. Much of his life was spent in the brutal grip of Stalinism. He was constantly under pressure to churn out music that fed the Russian propaganda machine. And that he did. But that led to an almost unbearable inner turmoil, appalled as he was by the horrors he witnessed. So here's someone who's not in a strange land. He's a stranger in his own land. Psalm 88, you have caused friend and neighbor to shun me. All his life, Shostakovich found it almost impossible to trust anyone. I think of the awkward introvert at the party. There, but not there. The professor at Duke in a department she hates, not knowing who to trust. Three million Yemenis, as I speak, displaced in their own country. A country they don't recognize anymore, strangers in their own land. Of course, Shostakovich rarely dared to speak about this estrangement publicly. In speeches, he's fiercely patriotic. But his music, well, that tells a different story. As in the second movement of his second piano concerto, written four years after the death of Stalin. Now the major chords of Rachmaninoff have given way to a much darker tonality. You get wonderful beams of sunlight, but it most definitely returns to this. It's the last two minutes of this piece are nothing but that chord. I invite you to hear this then, as the brooding of the exile in his own land, estranged from his own kin. Psalm 69, I'm a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children. Or more pointedly from John's Gospel, he came to his own, and his own knew him not.
Shostakovich didn't stop there, as we'll find out after the interval. But for now, a third musical take on not being at home. In this piece we've just heard, for all the estrangement and mournfulness, it still remains at home. There we are oriented around that center. But for thousands today, where is home when your house is buried under three feet of rubble? Where is home when the 147 freeway displaces hundreds of largely colored residents? Where is home when you're mentally ill with schizophrenia and you're forced to wander the streets? This too has been played out in music and we'll call it the music of disorientation. This is music by the Hungarian Bela Bartok. He's got a bad reputation among some. His name on a concert poster will cut an audience by about 50%. And that's a pity because he's actually delightful, at least a lot of his music is, but he has his scary moments. And this is one of them, stuck in the middle of a piece called Divertimento for Strings. There is a home, yeah, just, and it's this note we heard at the start, just, but how fragile, how unstable, how uncertain. And the music doesn't stay there, it wanders as if at night, with nothing solid to get hold of, creeping fearfully from one uncertainty to another. The year is 1939, and Bartok's beloved Hungary is under threat. He's lived through something they called the White Terror, the brutal hounding of Jews, communists, intellectuals. Hitler's armies are already amassing across Europe. And Hungary is taking a strongly pro-Nazi stance. So the threat of war looms. And this appalls Bartok. He fears the destruction of everything he holds dear. He even fears for his own life, so outspoken is he against the regime. Soon after writing that music, he flees into exile as a refugee, never to return to his homeland. It's hard to believe there's not something of that background in what we've just heard, but also a little later in the piece, in the middle of the piece, we hear this melody. that with me? Uh. Let's do that with the violas and cellos. Same thing again. It's lovely. Uh. That's home for Bartok, 
quite literally. It is a folk melody from Hungary that he knew well. He collected hundreds of folk melodies, and he repeats it over and over again, the security of home. But on this side, among the violins, a rising wail threatening to destroy that home. Every note they play on this side destroys or threatens to destroy this. The rhythm of these players is literally <laughs> displaced. It's never coordinated with that. The harmony is dissonant in every single note. So what we hear is home and the destruction of home together. Music is extraordinarily capable of doing that because it can mix radically contradictory things in the same sound space that we hear. And that's what makes it so disorienting, so disturbing. The Psalms are full of this kind of disorientation. Walter Brueggemann even has a whole group of Psalms under this heading. Psalm 79. O oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defied your holy temple, reducing Jerusalem to rubble. The temple, the home, God's dwelling place, the hub of Israel's life, the focus of its worship. Where is home if the temple is under threat? Indeed, where is God? Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept. Have a look at that psalm when you get home. It's not even addressed to God. Because when you are far from Jerusalem, when you are really in exile, you are far from God. Into this disorientation, Jesus goes. He stands at the edge of the holy city. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He sees his beloved home and he sees the devastation to come at the same time. Let's do this from 32, a little bit slow.
few minutes, we'll take a 15-minute interval. But to take us there, our fourth musical take on not being at home, in music of isolation. We meet this, of course, again and again in the Psalms, in the first-person laments especially, Psalm 102. I'm like an owl in the desert, an owl in the ruins, I lie awake. I've become like a bird alone on a roof. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Toward the end of the Second World War, a Jewish Czech singer, Karel Berman, was held in a series of concentration camps and eventually at Auschwitz. In 1945, he wrote a piano piece simply called Alone, Alone one of a series of reminiscences of life in the camps. Here, I've arranged it for orchestra. It's a song without words, for a time when words break down. A song, the singing voice, perhaps the most basic form of emotional communication. A single singing voice, represented here by a solo clarinet, stands out against the cold, mechanical banality of evil. In preparing this, it struck me, this is the undoing of nearly everything we heard in the Copeland. No triumphant ending of soaring chords, just a single lonely voice. Its main melody doesn't rise, it falls over and over again. The fourths and the fifths, these open intervals, are back with us, but now they've turned sour. Why play this music? Indeed, why have I taken you on this musical journey into exile? Quite simply, because this is the way God himself goes. It is the way of the Son of God into the far country to break the stronghold of evil and bring us back home.
priest of a mission church leads his people home under the sign of the cross. Many of you will have seen the movie, The Mission, I'm sure. It tells the story of 18th century Jesuits who try to protect a remote South American Indian tribe from falling under the rule of pro-slavery Portugal. The tiny church is no match for the Portuguese and Spanish armed forces as their chapel burns, as men, women, and children are being gunned down by the colonizers. The crucifix leads the way, and that's the music that we hear. They are led home by the cross, for this is the road Jesus has gone to lead them home, and us also. And that's what the resurrection gloriously confirms on the third day. Karl Barth speaks of the resurrection as the homecoming of the Son of Man, and so it is, home to the Father and to the life awaiting those who follow him. But let's be clear, this isn't a return to the old life. The life to come is a kind of life that bursts the bounds of what we know now. It's a kind of giant makeover. Home with a capital H. And no one knows that better than the composer J.S. Bach, who has the advantage of having the same initials as myself, J.S.B. <laughs> now, for years, music scholars have scratched their heads as to how Bach's music is so brilliantly constructed, so dazzlingly well-formed, but at the same time, bursts out of that form, often giving the impression it could go on forever and would never sound dull. It's ordered and infinitely abundant, it seems, at the same time. And that's the resurrection. For Bach, Jesus doesn't come back to the old life. He's not resuscitated. He's full of the life to come, infinitely fuller than this one. He doesn't make you long for a past. He makes you long for a future that's been promised in Christ, a future where the wine never runs out and the singing never ceases. Now, let's get a feel of that in this piece that's going to be played now, the first movement of Bach's second Brandenburg Concerto. Musicologists have long tried to analyze this movement, which they're going to play now. It's recognizable as Baroque music. It makes wonderful sense, but at the same time, it bursts out of the well-known Baroque schemes even as he uses them. It's almost impossible to analyze. He even exceeds the proper range of instruments. This Andy Balio from the Baltimore Symphony, this is what, Andrew? A piccolo, a piccolo trumpet. Why do you need a piccolo trumpet? What's wrong with an ordinary trumpet? This looks like it hasn't been fed for a long time. <laughs> but it reaches stratospherically high notes, as you will hear. Um, ridiculously high notes. You could say over-the-top high notes, but that's what Bach is doing. It makes wonderful sense, this music, and it bursts its bounds at the same time. That's the life we can know even now. Over to you folks.
worth remembering that there's nothing sentimental about Bach. Half of his 20 children, 10 of his 20 children, died in infancy. His first wife died. What we're hearing here is life in the midst of loss, life in the midst of death, a defiant hope in the midst of the threat of death. And to open that up a little more, I hand over to my dear friend and colleague, Luke Parry, of Dean of Duke Chapel. I hope he is here somewhere. There is the good man. Would you welcome, please, Luke, to the bar? After that Bach piece, you can't say anything but wow. <laughs> Jeremy asked me to do something with the spirituals. The spirituals, as he mentioned earlier about this haunting of homelessness, W.E.B. Du Bois in the early 20th century called the spirituals a haunting echo that still reverberate down the acoustical corridors of history. And the spirituals remind us how hope rises out of the ashes of despair and depression. There's an honesty. They remind us how uh, there can't be resurrections without crucifixions. And so even these songs created in uh, brutal slavery, even as we think about the Middle Passage and being disconnected from family, a primary social unit, disconnected from home, you hear that hope in many ways is tinged with sorrow. There's a sorrowful joy, to use the words of Princeton historian Al Rabato. And so to enter into this mixed texture, I offer this, and for one of these, I will need your voices and bodies, okay? Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a marvelous child a long ways from a home the long Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Oh, from home. 
been for to carry me home. I looked over Jordan and what did I see? What coming Six children, a band of angels coming after me. Coming for to carry me Sing, swing low, swing low Coming for to carry me home We're going swing low, swing Coming for to carry me home. The leader says, if you get to there before I do, coming Coming for to carry me. Come on, you can do better than that. Coming, coming for to carry me. Now this section coming for to carry. Coming for to carry me. Come on, musicians, coming for. Coming for to carry me. Coming for to carry me home. What a privilege to have this man as our dean. Our Dean of the Chapel, thank you so much. And how appropriate for this theme. But also in our light of theme of home, we're delighted this evening is supporting the Corner House community here in Durham. They describe themselves as a community of friends with diverse abilities, gifts, limitations, challenges, sharing, and the beauty of the gospel. Um, when I was there last week, for me, this place embodies really what we're about this evening. God's welcoming us home, giving us a home in his own life and a home in this world. I'm going to hand over to, is it Greg? Is Greg here? Greg, come along. Please to come up. Would you welcome Greg? This is Tequila, I think, is it not? Yeah. This is Greg, who's leader of the community. Please do come up. My name's Greg, and Tequila and I have a home at the Corner House. And uh, it's a great honor to be here and to be able to share with you a bit of our life together, and especially to be here with Miss T. She's a woman that I admire greatly and have seen Jesus in a great deal. So she's going to share a bit of her story. We have some things written down, but I think we're going to go question and answer. Um, so, Miss T, could you tell us a bit about your home when you were younger? Get real close to this. I used to live with my grandmother, and that was home for me. And why was that home for you? She raised me to be independent and love everybody. And after living with your grandma, where did you live? And then I moved to group homes, and that wasn't home for me. 
because the people was mean to me. I don't like mean people. I started going to reality ministry. Can you tell them what reality is? Reality is for people with and without disability. To help them in the community to learn stuff. Do you like reality? I don't just like reality, I love reality. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you like reality? I met a lot of my friends that I love. So reality, um, just to fill in the gaps, if anybody here doesn't know Reality Ministries, um, reality is a nonprofit here in Durham, and we are committed to proclaiming that we all belong to Jesus. Um, at reality, oh, there's a picture of us. At reality, we're committed to proclaiming that the deepest reality of all of our lives is God's inexhaustible mercy, God's love for us, and we receive um, that is revealed to us in Jesus. And the way that we proclaim that at reality is through friendship. And so we have a lot of different programs, but the, the pathway for witnessing to Jesus' love for us is making room for friendships. Um, and so Tequila used to have this mantra at the end of hanging out at reality the last several years, what did you used to say when you left reality? Can I go home with you? <laughs> uh, and it, uh, she had no favoritism. It was to basically everybody. Um, and Tequila, do you want to share what, about eight months ago, what happened? I moved to North Street. And I finally moved into a community that I thought would be home for me. It's called the Corner House. Is it, home for you? it is a home for me. Because I get to do I get to do chores that I like, like clean my room, do the dishes, cook. I like all the people that live at the corner house. In just a couple minutes, Miss T is going to share the end of a poem that she wrote for her grandmother. Um, but first, I would love to introduce those of us that are here that live in the corner house. Um, so if you, everybody's here except for one, could y'all stand and um, wave? <laughs> Tony's pretty smitten with what's going on tonight. So this is Tony. That's Miss Bonnie. Bonnie, you want to wave? Lee. Janice, and our newest member of the community, Miss Joyana. Um, they're deeply connected to me. And then Erin Payne is not here. She's the only one that's not here. So we are a family, a, a different sort of family of eight right now. Um, so a few of us that had tasted and glimpsed the beauty of Jesus in the midst of the friendships at Reality, decided um, we wanted to go a little bit deeper. Or, or perhaps that we sensed God calling us to go deeper. And so we asked, what if we lived together? What if um, we created a home, a home that could be a place of peace, a place of care, a place of gentleness, in the midst of a world that, where we see so much that is not gentle, that is filled with fear and competition, um, that's saturated in efficiency. We are certainly not efficient in our house, but we, we hope to be a place of care. We hope to be a place of care. And so from the beginning, we've had two charisms, and those have been prayer and hospitality. And so in our home, we have eight people living there, and then we have a set-apart room for prayer, a chapel, for our neighborhood's rhythms of daily prayer. And then we have uh, what we call a Christ room, which is, remains open and watchful to receive people who need a place to stay as we would receive Jesus for short-term stay. 
And so we're, we decided to try this little way together. Uh, and we ask tonight, I ask tonight, Miss T and I have talked about this ask for y'all to pray for us at the corner house. Please pray for us. We desire to welcome one another in the home as Jesus welcomes us. And we hope that the overflow of that welcome and care for each other is that people that come into the home will find a place to belong, a place of rest, a place of peace. So Ms. T is going to read this poem, the end of this poem, and then Tony is going to say a, bus, a prayer for us, because um, we are a community of prayer. When I think of mom, I think of Pearl. She is my grandmother. She likes to dress up, but she didn't like dresses, so I am no fan of dresses. She told me she sung me to sleep. We hum our always. She started and I followed along. God is a person to love. We humble, I will always love you. And out the door, she reminded me, be kind. And God is a person to love. She knew that fools will always come around. She said to me, be kind and they'll always come around. I wish I could show her it's true. If today was tomorrow, I give her a tour and stop at Coco and Cinnamon for tea. I wish she'd come back to the mama I knew in the nursing home. She listened. When today is tomorrow, she meet all my family, the corner house family, who are kind and love me. Her name is Mary, but I called her mom. She is my hero. She smells like white diamond. I am no fan of dresses. Purple is my favorite color too. Tony, could you pray for us, please, as we go into the, the rest of our evening? Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful, beautiful place, and thank you, Boston uh, Symphony and Boston Pops. You always make my day much brighter, and I'm saying thank you, and I've heard of y'all and take care of everybody else at the corner house too and pray for us as me and Greg and the rest of us been living there for a very long time and as we see it now I love every minute of it in Jesus sake amen One of the things, if you visit the community there, you find over and over again is that ordinary things and ordinary people are recreated. You take now just a very ordinary musical instrument played by this wonderful percussion player, John. John, come along up here, and without any words, here's just a, a tambourine of the sort we've all seen. Perhaps we fear in certain churches, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> It's an extraordinary, banal-looking thing. Over to you, John.
Right. Another example of recreation. If you're a young pianist, you will often hear this. These are known as hand-on exercises, and they're murder for parents of 14-year-olds who have to play this stuff over and over again. This is banal. It is ordinary. No one would ever listen to that. But when you, if you're a Shostakovich, then it's a little bit different because he takes this, among other things, and he turns it into music. And so on, as you will hear in a second. This is the piece that follows the very dark and mournful music we played earlier by Shostakovich. It's the finale of the second piano concerto. And as we approach, as it were, the final homecoming, this evening. What can I say about this other than that it's a ridiculous romp? It is a ridiculous homecoming. Fatted calves flying about all over the place. That's what you need to, to think of. Um, it's also a bit risky, but we're going to risk it just for you. This is the new creation. The most ordinary things.
My dear friend Michal O'Shiel, Irish poet, extraordinaire. Irish. This collected poem is about 900, collected poem, about 900 pages. And as I was reading them all, I found one poem which perfectly summed up the piece we've just heard, Mill. And I really mean it almost word for word. So I'm so sorry, I almost forgot that. There's a microphone there for you. Please do read it and say anything else that you would like to say. Yes, I, I, I thought I was like Gracie Fields. I brought my harp to the party and no one asked me to play. <laughs> Not at all, it's been a wonderful evening. So in retrospect, this piece, it, uh, uh, the poem is called Music. Music, always music. And when the violins tumble, a thief has entered me. Come and gone. A sneaking our anarchy, leaving spores of memories I never had. Incognito, whimpers through crevices and pores, quick bowings of a violin, furious pizzicato of what has been, whinnies and hops beyond a future I can't imagine. My vigilance breaks down, rupture of being. This syncopation, offbeat, out of phase with myself, I vibrate. What's this breathlessness I can't catch up with? That flight of birds mincing up a treble clef, lines of joy, matrix of frontiers, every good boy deserves favor. <laughs> Silences are spelling face. Endless glory of some muteness that eludes me. Approach of another face, tremolo of forsakenness, naked and homeless. How can I fold and suckle all its orphanhood? Music, always music. Neighbor, are you the face of that thief breaking in, hollowing me out? A tumbling violin breathes its cries in me. I'm womb and mother.
It's your turn now, folks. Would you stand? What else can we do but sing? Would everybody stand? This will be straightforward. In the beginning of this, you'll hear Copeland again, but uh, a little bit different.